Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to the CIS Case Conference webinar series for the month of June. My name is uh, Andy Snow, and I'm joined by my co-moderator, uh, Dr. Jude Hajar at the Baylor College of Medicine. Um, as always, uh, we'd like to thank USIDNet and LACID for their generous support of this webinar series. And this is brought to you by the Early Career Immunologist Committee at CIS. Tonight, we have two uh, really interesting cases um, coming all the way from Italy and Israel. So we thank our uh, presenters for, for being up so late in their respective time zones. Um, so without further ado, I will uh, turn it over to my co-moderator, uh, Dr. Jude Hajar from the Baylor College of Medicine. She will moderate uh, the case presented by Dr. David Hagen, who joins us today from the Tel Aviv Sarosky Medical Center in Israel. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Andy, for uh, the introduction. And uh, uh, um, we'll just go ahead and start as a really interesting case uh, about a patient with uh, uh, ITP and Hodgkin's disease. So David, take it away. Thank you. Um, first of all, thank you for letting me join the, and present my case. Um, I'm glad um, to have this opportunity. Um, I would like to tell you about um, what I think is an interesting case of a uh, 42-year-old um, Georgian Jewish male. And Georgian, I mean in the West, uh, the South Pacific, the South Asian uh, Georgia. Um, this, uh, this guy was referred by Imhonk uh, for evaluation of possible immune deficiency and the history was um, mostly significant for ITP and uh, Hodgkin disease. Um, and if we'll go through the history, um, my patient was healthy until the age of 25. Um, at the age of 25, and we're talking about 17 years ago, he first presented with ITP um, and very low platelet counts. He was treated first with IVAG and later with steroids um, and responded to treatment. But over the next five years, he had several exacerbations and required addition of um, more steroid pulses. Uh, at the age of 30, and this is um, 2005, uh, he underwent uh, splenectomy. I don't know exactly why he wasn't treated with rituximab, but that was um, the next step. Um, and, and the thing that uh, we should note is that he had uh, quite an enlarged spleen, respectively. He already had an enlarged spleen when he first presented at the age of 25. Um, the pathology report from that splenectomy um, shows normal pathology, so there was nothing unusual in that spleen according to um, the records that I had. Also, during these uh, five years, he underwent three or four bone marrow biopsies because somebody was concerned about the possibility of malignancy and everything was normal. Um, fast forward um, several years later, at the age of 36, he develops uh, B symptoms with recurrent fevers, significant night sweats, and weight loss. Um, on imaging studies, um, we can see diffuse lymphadenopathy. At the same time, he also had low platelet counts again, and again responded to IVIG treatment. And finally, um, another lymph node biopsy, as well as bone marrow biopsy, established a diagnosis of EBV negative uh, Hodgkin disease. Um, at the end of 2012, he's completing for a six round of ABVD um, and have normal post-treatment uh, PET-CT. Uh, so first seem to respond to treatment, but again, two years later, he develops general weakness and lower back pain. It took, I would say, several months to uh, find out that he again um, had recurrence of his disease. He had abnormal MR studies and biopsy uh, confirmed recurrence of his Hodgkin disease. Um, with um, abnormal pathology in the lower spine. Um, the second uh, line of treatment is three rounds of ice uh, and autologous stem cell transplant. Um, again, follow-up after that seems to be okay with normal PET-CT, but two years later, and that's the beginning of this year, he presents again with lower back pain symptoms. Again, abnormal uh, PET-CT and biopsy confirms the second relapse of his Hodgkin disease. Um, if we are going through um, a review of systems and history of infection, family history, and physical examination, I would say that um, he mostly these were mostly disappointing because this patient doesn't have any GI symptoms, no respiratory symptoms, um, no endocrine issues. He had um, fa facial nerve palsy twice, um, assumed to be part of his disease, but otherwise 
um, no other uh, system involved. He also doesn't have any history of infections other than post-transplant shingles, which I think it's reasonable to assume that um, he can have it, but no pneumonia, no viral infection, no fungal infection, and nothing at all. Also has negative family history. He has another sister, which is healthy. He has two kids, totally healthy, and his extended family, there is no history of recurrent infections, autoimmunity or malignancies other than that. Um, and on physical examination, and that's about the time I would say before he was diagnosed again with relapse of his disease, you know, I could feel mild bilateral uh, lymphadenopathy, ax axillary lymphadenopathy, but not much more than that. Um, so, so far, this is a case of uh, an adult patient with history of ITP and maybe aggressive Hodgkin disease. Um, and I would like to ask you if you would consider further testing in this case. So we invite um, our attendee to uh, place their questions in the attendee chat box. And uh, we have a question. During time of splenectomy, was someone able to do flow to rule out double negative T cells? Um, no, I don't think anybody thought about that option. Um, but I think that that's a good question. And we also, um, I was also wondering if I should do that. Um, so I see as people suggest yeah, it makes sense to do to go on and, and look for other uh, reasons. Um, there is no history of herpes viruses except for the exacerbation of the shingles around the um, uh, post-transplant. Uh, I don't have soluble fast ligand and it's not that available for me to, to do it. Um, so let me show you what I do have and we can go from there. Um, so By the way, David, this Yes. Um, yeah, uh, on one of your slides, you actually indicated, I thought that the double negative T cells were less than 1%. Uh, yeah, I'm coming to that. Right from, uh, oh, sorry, I'm ahead of you. Sorry, I got that. <laughs> okay. No, no, that's fine. Um, so, yeah, for me, it wasn't that clear that, I mean, you can see adults patients with history of ITP and Hodgkin disease is something you can see. So, yeah, I would, uh, I would like to know if there is something more than that, but it wasn't the classic PIDD case. Um, but then I went over all his lymph node biopsies and all the biopsies that he had in his record. So, as I mentioned, when he first presented with ITP in the first few years, he had several uh, bone biopsies and I just reviewed the record, everything was normal. Um, in 2005, when he had the splenectomy, so both the bone marrow biopsy and the splenic pathology was seen to be uh, normal and supported the diagnosis of ITP and nothing more than that. But then over the years, and that's about the time that he also was diagnosed with Hodgkin disease, there were a lot of lymphocytes all the time. So there was a lymph, lymph, uh, lymph node biopsy with follicular hyperplasia. There was a bone marrow biopsy uh, with, with uh, something that was reported as reactive lymphoid follicles. For some reason, he also had liver biopsy. I think it was when he presented with the B symptoms and people were looking for the uh, for lymphoma. So he had atypical portal lymphoid infiltrates. And again, um, more lymph node biopsies over the years, but the years showing reactive lymph nodes. Um, and, and the latest one, bone marrow biopsy from 2015, again showed uh, benign lymphoid aggregates, uh, and that's about a year uh, post dotologous stem cell transplant. So yes, there were a lot of lymphocytes. Um, I don't have a lot, the complete labs that I would like to have on this guy, but what I can say is that the lymphocyte subsets uh, showed elevated number of lymphocytes with the total uh, lymphocyte and CD3 count of above 3K. Um, he had elevated counts of CD8 cells, so no, lymph, uh, so no lymphopenia uh, whatsoever. Um, antibody levels were mostly normal, except for mild IgM uh, uh, deficiency or lower levels of IgM. Um, he also had protective titers against specific antibodies, uh, protective titers against specific vaccines, and that include uh, hepatitis A and B, measles, diphtheria, and tetanus. I don't have the pneumococcal, and in any way, we're doing just total pneumococcal titers, so... Uh, uh, I don't have these results. It was negative for mumps, and all these um, were done, I would say, about three or four months after we was rechallenged with vaccines because it was post-transplant. The double negative T cells were checked, and that was less than 1%. And if we're trying to push it that way of the Alps, so the other uh, markers that I could use, he had normal uh, B12 levels and maybe low HDL levels. Um, David, there was a question about EBV. 
uh, was it checked in this patient? That was done in the first, uh, it, it was Eber negative uh, Hodgkin disease. So that's something that was checked at the beginning. Uh, so as far as I know, it was uh, EBV negative. Um, okay. What I don't have um, in the lab that I would like to have is the B-cell and T-cell phenotyping. And I don't have T-reg phenotyping. And I wasn't sure how to, to address this test also uh, at that time point, which is basically post autologous transplant. So I don't know what to expect also from the double negative T-cell in this case and how long it takes them to show up after um, chemotherapy with autologous uh, stem cell transplants. Um, so what I have now is basically the same, a patient with ITP um, and uh, what seems to be aggressive disease, Hodgkin disease. Mostly normal labs, but there are a lot of lymphocytes uh, all over the place on, on different biopsies. Um, so my question now is, would you consider genetic testing in this 42-year-old guy with normal family history, normal labs, and a sad story of uh, recurrent Hodgkin disease? So it seems that some of the audience already is suggesting some genetic diagnosis, and I would invite the attendee again to kind of uh, put any comments that they have about this case. We have already a suggestion for a CTLA-4. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So David, why don't you tell us what, uh, where, where your process of thinking uh, until we get some people to kind of uh, put in their answers. Like at this point, what were you thinking pro and against and what were the limitations for uh, pursuing genetic testing at this case? Um, I think I think it was also coming from um, actually I laid it out to the patient that yes yeah, something um, is uh, unusual in this case I think I think yes you can have Hodgkin disease and yes the hematologists were not that surprised that you can have recurrent uh, recurrence of Hodgkin disease and they see those cases all the time um, and also there was a question there, there was. I think there was an explanation to a lot of things. Um, there was an explanation for the lymphadenopathy because he had malignancy. He had lymph lymphoid malignancy, so it makes sense to have um, enlarged lymph node. And yeah, ITP might also be associated with uh, um, future uh, development of malignancies. But the, the unusual things here were, I would say, the, splen uh, the splenomegaly at the beginning. Um, and again, those lymphocytes that were showing up in all the biopsies and maybe also the aggressive Hodgkin disease, I think there was a reason to ask why. And that's the reason, that's the way I laid that to the patient. Maybe we can ask why. Um, and the other hey, thing is, was... Hey, hey, David, can I ask a question? This is, this is Mike Jordan. Yeah, sure. Um, mm -hmm. Was he EBP pyremic uh, post-transplant or peritransplant? Because I'm sure they were looking, right? All these lymph nodes everywhere. Does he, is, I'm sorry? Is, um, yeah. All these, um, all, with all these uh, uh, lymphocytes everywhere, was he EBV viremic around this? Uh, no, he was not. He was not. It None was of ever PTLD or anything like that. No, it was EBV negative, uh, and that was checked several times. So we did, it wasn't it was EBV negative. Yeah, and that's something that I asked uh, after that, and just to make sure because yeah, I think uh, that could explain a lot of things, and might also direct to a certain evaluation or search for other genetic uh, defects. Um, and David, there was another question about CMV and whether EBV was by PCR was negative. Like how did you check for EBV and whether you so checked first, for CMV? First it was an, um, the, the, the RNA on the biopsy itself. And then, uh, yes, we had, I believe we had both CMV and EBV on PCR checked uh, post-transplant. Um, okay. And, in, on all cases, I think it was, uh, I believe it was negative. There was no no evidence for EBV or CMV. Okay. Mm -hmm. well, uh, we have one comment uh, saying that XLP has not been yet excluded. Did you no, guys no. think about XLP? And... Um, uh, that's, I mean, he, he didn't smell like HLH or didn't have an HLH uh, uh, sense uh, in a way. Um, but yeah, I think that's something that you can think of. Uh, Again, lymphadenopathy, a lot of lymphocyte. Yeah, we can think about that. Um, I tend to agree with uh, our friend from Sydney. Yeah, that's what we thought as well. Uh, we can do uh, 
whole exome sequencing, and in that case, uh, just to increase our chances of something finding something, we decided to go on with the trio whole exome sequencing. Um, one of another reason to pursue that is that this patient already had the total stem cell transplant, and the next step in his treatment uh, might be affected by his uh, underlying diagnosis because instead of trying a different line of chemotherapy or other treatment, that might direct us actually uh, to pursue uh, allogeneic stem cell transplant if um, it is possible. So that was the other reason to uh, go on and, and try and figure out what going what is going on. Um, hey, but was there a homozygote? Uh, I'm sorry, was there any consanguinity uh, between the parents? So they denied any consanguinity, but uh, I would say that this is a Jewish, a Jewish community in a very small uh, ge geographic area. So I have to assume that there is uh, some consanguinity, even though they deny it. I think they came from small villages um, nearby, and again, uh, Jewish population. So yeah, that was the assumption that there is uh, uh, some consanguinity. Um, so, um, if you want me to go on, uh, we did yes, send yes. three whole exome sequencing, and what we found um, is homozygous cell RBA mutation uh, with a stop codon uh, in, in the middle of the protein. For me, it was quite a surprise because that's not the way I know or I read about LRBA, and it's usually supposed to start at a very uh, young age, or at least at an earlier uh, age. Um, so the next thing that we had in mind is to ask, it makes sense to ask whether or not it's a pathogenic mutation. I think it's straightforward to say that probably a stop codon is a pathogenic mutation. Um, this mutation was not described before. If you check exact or uh, DBSNP or the EVS, you can find it. There are other uh, amino acid substitution at the same position, which are predicted to be uh, patho pathogenic based on both uh, CIF SIFT and polyphen. Um, and I'm sure you all know this paper. Um, the mutation, this top codon actually will bring to termination of the protein around uh, the beach domain. And you can see um, on the left side, a uh, schematic uh, uh, figure showing the, uh, the protein. On the right side, uh, that's from um, Jordan's paper, science paper, showing that actually the um, pH and the beach domain are the one that uh, interact with CTLA4. And therefore, when we have this stop codon just before the beach domain, I can assume that um, there is no re recycling of CTLA4. And therefore, um, this will be a pathogenic mutation with abnormal CTLA4 and trafficking in lower CTLA4. I, do not ha I don't have flow uh, data and staining for CTLA4 yet, but something that I would like uh, uh, to do um, later. Um, the last thing that I want to tell you about is um, when I was doing my fellowship um, in Seattle at uh, Troy's lab, um, we had a repository of IPEX-like patients. When I was going through these samples, there was one uh, sample that was actually sent from Israel um, of an IPEX-like patient. Um, and this patient had classic uh, IPEX-like symptoms. He presented at a very young age with chronic diarrhea and FTT. He had type 1 diabetes, and um, maybe more interestingly, interesting is that he uh, later developed gastric cancer and uh, died at the age of 15. And just before I left, we were able to send um, samples, uh, DNA samples for exome uh, uh, data or um, a genetic panel, and what we found, and that was exactly surprising, is the exact same mutation um, of the stop codon, same position, another uh, Georgian child, but unrelated to this family. So that was the second uh, child, uh, second person with the same mutation and um, severe symptoms. Um, if you want to make it more interesting, we know now about another uh, child with LRBA deficiency and gastric cancer. So the way I see it now is that maybe um, LRBA also plays a role in uh, um, in some um, tendency to develop malignancies. Um, what next as far as it's concerned to this patient? Our patient is currently treated, treated with um, anti-CD30. Um, and one point that I brought up when I was discussing with the Hemont is that they were considering um, anti-PD-1 treatment as the next step in his treatment. Um, 
I don't know if it makes sense to anyone, but there are two um, back-to-back science paper uh, earlier this year showing actually that both um, anti-PD-1 and uh, anti-CTLA-4 signal through the same pathway of CD28. I think it's clear to us all that CTLA-4 is kind of competing with CD28. So the anti-CTLA-4 will block uh, this competition and allow more signaling through the CD28. Uh, by PD-1, but PD-1 um, is also signaling through CD28. And what PD-1 is doing is to uh, induce dephosphorylation of the intracellular part of CD28. My concern was that in this patient, when we already have abnormal CTLA-4 signaling because of abnormal trafficking or recycling of CTLA-4 with the LRBA, and once we'll be using PD-1, anti-PD-1, I don't have any way to predict how severe the um, reaction to checkpoint inhibitor will be. Um, so that's something I don't have an answer to. I think this is something we should consider in these cases. Um, and that's why um, I tend to push more uh, for allogeneic stem cell transplant in this case. And we're, that's something we're still considering. And we're starting also um, a search for a match donor. Um, so my conclusion or questions um, is first, does LRBA play a role in malignancies? Um, I would say that if you search the literature, the first thing that comes up that is that you get elevated LRBA levels in um, breast cancer and prostate cancer, so it should be pro-malignant and not suppress uh, and not promote malignancies. So higher LRBA levels are associated with malignancies and not the other way around. So it might be interesting to uh, think about a way uh, to study uh, the relation between LRBA deficiency and malignancies. And more generally, I would ask myself, should we lower the threshold for genetic testing in other cases? I mean, people do see, for example, patient with uh, aggressive Hodgkin disease or aggressive lymphoma. And I think lymphadenopathy is something that we see. So obviously it's a matter of cost, and uh, but maybe we should um, be more aggressive in investigating those cases. And my final conclusion is probably that there is no age limit for PIDD. Um, there was um, a Jackie paper at the beginning of 2016 describing 22 patients with uh, uh, LRBA deficiency. The youngest age in this group was uh, 17. Um, and if before I end up, I just had another slide summarizing the symptoms uh, of the patient in this uh, in that paper. So. You can see a list of the symptoms. ITP was in 52% of the cases. Uh, splenomegaly was found in 64% of this, space, of this uh, population. But my patient didn't have all the other symptoms. So no infection, no antibody deficiency, no antibody deficiency, maybe some lymphadenopathy, but no other autoimmune manifestation. So yeah, maybe we should um, be more suspicious and uh, lower our threshold for investigation. So thank you. Uh, uh, that was great, that David. Was before David, we let Dr. Um, Jordan comment, uh, we have uh, one was whether a batocept was um, considered in this case. I, I think it should have been considered um, retrospectively when he presented only with uh, uh, the ITP. I think that now we're dealing that we're dealing with malignancies. I don't want to induce suppression. We're looking actually the other way around. We need to activate the immune system, so that's why PD-1 is considered. Um, if he didn't have LRBA mutation, maybe somebody would condition would consider a combination of uh, checkpoint inhibitor with anti-CTLA-4 and not the uh, abatacept. So I think it's it's the other way around right now, just because of the malignancy. Correct. And then yeah. the other question so David, that uh, uh, actually, uh, hey Jude, can I can I add one comment here? Absolutely. So, so David, yeah. uh, you know, I think it's I think it's fascinating uh, this you know this question about um, PD one inhibition and would he be more sensitive to the adverse effects of PD one inhibition because he may have sort of um, overly robust CD twenty eight signaling already. Um, I, I think that um, you know I think that's an interesting potential issue. But you know, remember PD one blockade is very therapeutic in Hodgkin's disease. So I don't think I would uh, withhold that uh, on, on concerns about the, you know, the toxicity because you don't really know. But the other thing, too, is that if he has undue toxicity, you actually have an antidote, and nabatacept would be the antidote uh, if, in fact, he has too much toxicity. So at least in theory, I should say, it would be the antidote. So. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
that's interesting. I, I, I'm glad to hear that because that's something that bothered me. And I, I, I don't know if it was only a theoretical uh, thing. Um, but still, I, I think if we have to think about something, it wouldn't solve the underlying problem that we have uh, now. So it might buy yeah. us some time. Um, and that's something we might yeah. try. No, I, think, I, think, um, I think allogeneic transplant is probably the most indicated thing if there's a suitable donor available, mm -hmm. uh, because he's already had you know, one life-threatening condition, and he's likely to have recurrence or something else that be, uh, becomes problematic. So. Uh, but I think this is an inter a fascinating uh, uh, case, again, demonstrating the sort of the variability, uh, the fact that you had other uh, patient, or you've seen another patient with the same mutation that had much uh, very early onset, and this one had a very late onset. I think there are, there are clearly disease-modifying genes that we don't understand yet. Um, I've seen in families um, a wide range from, you know, in the same family, same mutation, early childhood to through adulthood in terms of presentation. So. I think this is another example of that. Mm -hmm. It is. And uh, in terms and of malignancies, was... you know, LRBA deficiency, um, LRBA deficiency has been reported uh, associated with lymphoma before, as well as CTLA-4 haploinsufficiency uh, and activating PI3 kinase delta mutation. So a variety of mutations that sort of, in a, in a somewhat cell autonomous fashion, uh, lead to T cell activation and immune deficiency have also each been associated with uh, lymphoma. So I think there is a sort of a general theme there um, that uh, maybe shouldn't be too surprising. Um, and if I, I can may uh, this in, in that same, uh, same direction, there is also a report of gastric cancer. So we had two patients with LRBA deficiency and gastric cancer, and there's also, a, I think, a Japanese report about gastric cancer. Um, with CTLA-4 uh, haploid insufficiency. So I, I don't think, I don't know if that's something that uh, is unique to uh, this deficiency or not. Uh, but yeah. may, can I ask you a question now, if that's okay? So sure. When, when, you found, when you found the sequence of these four amino acids that LRBA uh, interact with in the CTLA-4, do you know if there are other uh, proteins that express the same uh, uh, for amino acid sequence that LRBA binds to? Uh, maybe can explain malignancy? So, yeah, so that YV, yeah, the YVKM motif. Um, yeah, exactly. There are uh, just a handful of proteins that have that motif. And off the top of my head, I, I don't remember uh, the other ones, but it's actually something that's kind of searchable on protein databases. But it's, mm -hmm. it's um, in a very small number, though. Yep. And you know, actually, uh, LRBA is actually associated originally described in the context of actually breast cancer, uh, or one of the original papers, I should say. I don't know if it's the original one, um, as an overexpressed gene in uh, breast cancer. Uh, so, so I don't know exactly what it means for the biology of T cells as opposed to malignant cells. It may have obviously, it's such a big protein. It probably has a lot of functions, and it may have other completely different functions in the maybe in the setting of, of um, you know, carcinoma like breast cancer. Uh, the the gastric uh, carcinoma does seem to be something unique. I've never heard of that in other any other of these mutations that lead to sort of um, activation of T cells and, and PID. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That was great. Uh, uh, there was uh, one question uh, about whether you plan to test uh, the children of this patient for this genetic mutation. We plan to test both both his kids and his sister, mostly the sister here, because she might serve as a donor. And there was another case of LRBA um, that was diagnosed post-transplant already. And um, in that other case, uh, the donor was the sister. She was the match sibling donor, and she was actually a carrier after that. And, and even though she was a carrier, um, it seems at first, at least, that the transplant went well. So um, we want to make sure that she's not uh, homozygous, she doesn't have the same homozygous mutation, and she's not asymptomatic, but I think first, I mean, we'll do it in any case. Um, I hope she'll be a match and, and uh, only a carrier or negative for the mutation. Yeah, so, that yeah, was but really we will check everyone. Yes, uh, it's a great case, and uh, we finished on time, so I'm going to turn yeah. it back to Andy to go ahead and uh, introduce the second presenter. Okay, thanks, Jude. Um, so our second case comes from Dr. Francesco Settini at the University of Milan uh, by COCA. Um, as his slides come up, I just want to 
uh, thank Dr. Mike Jordan at Cincinnati Children's Hospital for serving as a senior mentor uh, tonight for both cases. So thanks for the extra effort. Um, so I'll let uh, Dr. Satini take it away from here. And hi, everyone. Thank you for uh, this opportunity. Uh, tonight, I would like to present a case uh, of a patient with an undefined syndrome, but I think it <clears throat> might be of interest for the com combined immunodeficiency and autoimmunity uh, he presents. So, um, I just have to ask, I don't see the bottoms to move forward to the slides, so I don't know how to move on. Can you see them uh, now, Francesco? They should actually appear on the bottom. You just have to bring your mouse. Okay, okay, okay. Okay, thank you. Yes. Okay. So, um, the patient is uh, now a 15-year-old male. Uh, he was born uh, as a late preterm, uh, adequate for gestational age. Uh, soon after, he presented uh, failure to thrive, and now weight and height are uh, below the third uh, percentiles. Um, soon, he showed uh, dysmorphic features, so uh, our patient clinic uh, uh, an exam and it was found to have bilateral flexion of the metacarpal pharyngeal joints coarse features wide forehead uh, sparse hair and eyebrows especially in the lateral third high nasal root low hanging columella chubby cheeks thick lips and uh, micrognathia uh, you also have has a severe developmental delay, and he showed also um, several urticaria and adverse drug reactions. Uh, regarding GIE symptoms, he underwent a gastroesophageal um, a, a gastric complication because of uh, a reflux disease, and now he has a chronic constipation. Um, he also uh, has uh, a bilateral hydrocele and a micropenis, and he underwent also to several cardiological surgeries because uh, uh, he had an interventricular defect, aortic rotation, double outlet of the right ventricle, of embotalis duct. Uh, he, he was on uh, um, cardiological uh, therapy, now he's okay in the is uh, of therapy. Um, he has uh, an history of infection, um, recurrent stomatitis, recurrent uh, upper respiratory infections, uh, cutaneous abscesses, and uh, one event of severe di diarrhea, uh, which ended with an apovolemic shock. Uh, in 2006, so when he was uh, something like uh, uh, four years old, uh, um, splenomegaly was found. The uh, diameter was uh, about 11 centimeters. Now it is about 17. Um, he also had and has um, several hematological uh, symptoms. Um, he had a chronic ITP. Uh, which now and then uh, relapses, and autoantibodies uh, were found. He has neutropenia mostly during infections, but no autoantibodies were found, and the recurrent uh, um, autoimmune hemolytic anemia, uh, and the COMB test is positive. Um, therapy for these events uh, um, was steroids and uh, uh, IVIG. Um, sometimes uh, we had a complete response, sometimes we had partial response, sometimes we had no response, and he's on chronic steroids since 2006. Um, because of the, the, the features of the patient, 
uh, Fanconi anemia was suspected, but the test on peripheral blood was negative. Uh, as you can see, this is the last bone marrow biopsy. Um, he has a 40% of cellularity. Megakaryocytes are increased with features uh, uh, with polymorphic features. He has this erythropoiesis. Uh, the myeloid cells are mostly segmented, and he has low plasma cells uh, infiltrate. So maybe now the, the first question I can ask to you is, uh, based on this data, uh, what do you think about this patient? So do we have any questions from the audience at this point? And uh, just to remind you, please use the chat box on the left side. I can start, uh, Francesco. How, do you have any family history? Was there any evidence of consanguinity in this family? Or do you have any background on the family? Mm, no consanguinity. Uh, I can tell you that the father and the um, gr uh, grandmother um, have uh, um, rheumatoid arthritis, and uh, one uncle has hyperthyroidism. Okay. Um, I think we have a question about um, IG, which I think we're going to come up to in a couple slides. Um, was there, were there, was there any dysmorphism um, consistent with fetal alcohol syndrome? No, no. Okay. Well, why don't we move on to the next slide at this yep. point, and then we'll we'll continue okay. to take questions. Yeah. Uh, so, as I as I told you. Uh, uh, at the beginning, the patient was uh, followed by our uh, genetic patient clinic. Um, this is the genetic workup. Several syndromes were suspected, uh, and so several tests tests uh, were performed. Mowat Wilson, Angelman, Prader Willi, uh, De George Williams, uh, the Schwachmann Diamond, all were negative. He also had a CGH array and a telomer assay, uh, which were negative. Uh, so um, this is the immunological workup we have performed. Um, he has lymphopenia since uh, 2010. Uh, as you can see, he has a very low CD19 C uh, and since 2011, uh, low CD4 uh, since 2013. He has an hypogamma globulinemia uh, since 2009, and no antibodies, uh, um, no response to tetanus and diphtheria uh, is found. Um, he has a reduced proliferation to PHA econ A. Uh, um, tracks uh, shows. Uh, polyclonal repertoire. Uh, we also performed an interference signature uh, last year, which was negative, but I have to uh, underline that the patient was under steroids, and um, we found a borderline IFI 27. Um, the, and the instability of the chromosomes uh, is, uh, is normal. Was this a, hey, this is Mike here. Is this a DEB when you say the stability is normal? What, what test was that? Uh, no. No, we have no... Um, I, we, we do not think uh, uh, of GI... Uh, that that uh, hypogamma and lymphopenia may be related to the GI symptoms. No, I mean, you said the... Uh, the chromosome instability assay was normal, but what what assay yeah. exactly was that? Um, uh, we have performed the karyotype, um, uh, and uh, the lab uh, told us that the um, um, chromosomes uh, were normal, so no instability was seen. Uh -huh. So just to carry that, but there wasn't a breakage study like with DEB, like when you're typically working up a, a Fanconi's patient. 
Uh, yes, we have then performed it uh, a few months ago with uh, bleomycin, uh, and it was uh, that was normal. Okay. Francesca, we have a question about, um, was there a chest x-ray to look at the thymus in this patient as an infant? Um, we uh, hadn't performed uh, when he was an infant. We had performed later and uh, no abnormality was found. Okay. So, um, because of the splenomegaly, uh, we have tested uh, uh, double negative T cells, uh, which were uh, elevated, increased, uh, even, the, even though the patient was under steroids, but uh, um, vitamin B12 was normal. Uh, we have uh, an abnormal uh, apoptosis assay, and um, a few years ago, uh, we performed uh, fast sequencing, uh, which was uh, negative. Francesco, could you, regarding the apoptosis yes. assay, when you say abnormal, could you just clarify what the 95% means on your slide? Does that mean a 95% defect or something? Or? Uh, the, the the normal value the the lab uh, has is 83 percent i see so the the um this was a a, a fast kill assay performed on t cells yeah that, yeah okay yes and, yeah. That, and that was the percent viability i guess afterward or is that sorry it, was that the 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 number of was that the percentage of viable cells uh, after the assay Yes. You say eighty. Okay. Okay. So you're so you're convinced there's a an apoptosis defect in the fast pathway, but there were no patients yeah. in fast itself. Yeah. Was that right? Yes. Okay. Any other thoughts from the audience? So we have some features consistent with an Alps-like diagnosis: a defective apoptosis assay, high double neg T cells and splenomegaly, obviously, but obviously not a, a classic ALPS with no fast mutations. Um, so I, I assume there may be sequencing coming up as, or sequencing done on fast ligand or any other components of the fast signaling pathway? Um, so, uh... The fast ligand mutation was uh, searched um, after. Uh, we have not the possibility to um, to test fast ligand on uh, on blood on plasma. Okay. And we have a question about the the double negative T cells. Were those uh, alpha beta T cells? Was that yeah those? yeah yeah okay okay yeah. So, uh, considering uh, that the patient showed uh, um, lymphopenia uh, and, and hypogammaglobulinemia, uh, we have extended our tests to uh, an extended lymphocyte phenotype last year. Uh, sorry, that is that um, is not on the same uh, row, but okay. Uh, we found uh, regarding the T cells. Um, an inverted CD8, CD, CD4, CD8 ratio. Uh, we found uh, a severe reduction of um, uh, recent immigrants and uh, uh, a reduction of uh, uh, recent B immigrants, low naive T cells, uh, uh, prevalence of high me of memory and effector subtype. Uh, a, B a total B reduction with low switched uh, B cells and uh, an increased uh, um, level of CD19 high, CD21 low. So, uh, I, mm, what genetic tests uh, do you think we 
should have considered. Do we have any ideas from the audience at this point in terms of a, a differential or some genes to go after? Did you test uh, PI3 kinase, Francesco? Yes. Okay. <laughs> yes. That was, that was negative. Aha, uh -huh. okay. Yes. That's what uh, we did. Uh, we checked. Even though um, EBV, uh, even though we never found EBV uh, because of the splenome splenomegaly and the other features, we checked for PI3K and um, R1 mutations uh, negative. We also checked for uh, GWAS and was negative. And then we had an NGS for. Um, Combined immunodeficiency, including RAG1, RAG2, uh, um, among the others. I mean, uh, XLF, Artemis, uh, LIG4, uh, negative, and uh, TACI, which was negative. So thereafter, uh, we performed the clinical exome sequencing, uh, which was negative. And in this sequencing uh, was included ALPS and uh, ALPS-like ALPS -like mutation mutations that were not included, that were not performed before, so fast ligand, CASP8, uh, 10, RAS, um, and all uh, came back uh, negative. Uh, so we asked, uh, asked to extend analysis uh, because of the slight elevation of IFI 27 to Stat three gain of function and stat five uh, B deficiency, uh, and it came back negative uh, because of the Alps-like phenotype. We asked for FAD, uh, which was negative, and other um, mutation related to the death sign signaling complex, so TRAD, RIP one, and tweak. Uh, everything was, again, negative. Even though uh, there is no clear uh, connection to uh, this case, we asked also for XRCC4 and for uh, mutation for B uh, BC syndrome. And again, everything was negative. Hmm. So we have a, a few thoughts from the audience. Um, when you did sequencing for FAST and related molecules, was to rule out uh, a diagnosis of uh, somatic ALPS, a somatic mutation in lymphocytes. Obviously, some of the symptoms from birth make that less likely, but could you rule that out? Well, um, I, mm, to be honest, I, no. Uh, but uh, uh, I think uh, uh, we can surely uh, ruled, ruled out uh, somatic uh, ALPS mutation, but it doesn't explain all the clinical phenotype of the patient, I think. Sure, sure. And then could you tell us a little bit about the thought process behind um, some of your, some of the genetic testing that was performed, like for uh, Westcott Aldrich? Was there a specific thought there as to why that was? Uh, I, I didn't get the, the answer, why? Yeah, why, uh, can you give us some, some insight into your thought process about testing um, uh, for Wiscott Aldrich syndrome or some of the other genetic tests? Well, um, we asked for it because of the chronic ITP, uh, which was for a long time his main uh, symptom, and uh, chronic ITP and splenomegaly and uh, uh, an history of uh, skin features, even though it's not the clear, the classical right. e eczema, uh, uh, we, we thought we had to rule, rule out uh, uh, this condition. Right. So we have some questions uh, related to thymic function as well. So uh, our colleague in Rome asked, did you check for the um, 10P deletion with regard to, to George? Um, have you checked uh, genes like 
uh, Fox N1 or Pax9 might be consistent with a thymic defect? Uh, okay, so uh, the Georgia, we can be quite sure it's excluded because um, the deletion should be uh, should have been uh, um, found with the uh, array, so, right. so right. we we did not found uh, regarding uh, um, Fox N one. Uh, it was uh, included in the clinical exome, and regarding uh, uh, Pax nine also. Okay, so and both both were negative, obviously. Yeah, negative. Okay. Um, we have a question for Chicago about yeah the fact that the thymic output isn't zero, right? It's just depressed. Is that is that a clue? Well, um, if you think about um, I don't know um, uh, A I R E, uh, right. it's negative. And uh, if you think about uh, uh, Fox P3, it's uh, also negative. Right. And regarding the um, some of the analyses you mentioned that were extended to um, death receptor signaling complex components, that I assume sequencing performed was exome. But um, has the as protein expression of it for any of those ever been checked in um, you know patient lymphocytes or just wondering if you know the expression a, a non exome mutation might cause um, lower expression of something like FAD or uh, no no we haven't okay. checked them uh, what kind of you mean we we should uh, check for every um, protein of these uh, possible uh, complex. Well, it, it, you know, if there were if there was a mutation in a non-coding uh, yeah. region that that might affect expression, I just wonder if uh, you know you might see, for example, um, you know, less expression of a protein like FAD. You know, that would be suggestive of you know, like a, a, a you know, FAD haploid sufficiency or it, 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 but this unrelated to an exomic mutation. That's obviously a more complicated. Um, yeah, I think it's a, a, a very good idea, but I, I don't know where uh, we can right. Uh, right. do this test. Right. Uh, at least here in Italy, I don't think we can uh, we can do it. Yeah, that'd be more complicated. Um, Francesco, I, I have a couple suggestions or questions. Um, you know, uh, it's. You know, nothing is a great fit for this diagnosis or for this case. It seems it seems sort of unique. But um, did you consider ICF, the Central American Stability and Facial Syndrome? Uh, yes, uh, I I thought about it, uh, but uh, um, considering that the um, uh, chromosome instability um, was not abnormal. Uh, uh, I think it's uh, something we, we can exclude, and uh, well, mm, yeah, I, I think so. so but I, we in, in the I clinical exam, I yeah, I can tell you I that in the clinical exam. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I, I don't think a, um, a karyotype is. A, um, well, it certainly may be abnormal. I don't think a karyotype is a a good test to exclude that. I think you have to sequence. The genes, or look at the sequence of the genes that are um, affected, and I don't think CGH would necessarily um, rule it out either. It's it's kind of variable. Um, so, um, but your your clinical exome was not just a targeted exome, right? It was actually looking broadly at any disease associated, you know, reporting any disease associated abnormalities. Um, well, I I can tell you that uh, um, in the clinical exome. Um, are not included uh, health and CDCA7. I think it's the, the are the last two uh, mutations uh, reported. But in the clinical exome are included the, the first two uh, two mutations 
uh, reported. I, I don't remember now the, the name of these two genes, but I'm, uh, I know for sure that the first uh, two mutations are included. But we can ask for health and uh, CDCA7 mutations. Francesco, we have a question. Yeah, no, I think, oh, go ahead. Sorry. Go, go ahead, Mike. No, no, I was going to say that answers my questions. I mean, really, that, I mean, the other thing is, is, could you think of other sorts of Tregopathies that might explain the disease? Mm -hmm. But if your exome is everything covered, I mean, the things not on your list here would be things like CD25 or even STAT1 uh, mutations. But uh, if they're all covered in your exome, then you know. I mean, they're not real likely anyway, but they're conceivable. As, and even, actually, I should point out LRBA, of course, is also conceivable, though it wouldn't explain all the dys dysmorphology. Uh, uh, STAT1 is, uh, is included, and it is negative. Let me check, but I, I'm pretty sure it was uh, uh, checked. Yes, it was checked, and it was negative. And CD25, uh, mm, no, that that one was not uh, searched. So we, we can ask for uh, CD25, yeah. Francesco, we have a question from uh, our colleague in Chicago. Was when On exam, was there any evidence of a dermopathy that would suggest some kind of issue with collagen or... Uh, no, no clue of it. No. Okay. Well, I think you, if you want to move to your final slide, yeah. and yeah, yeah. So this is the the current therapy uh, we are uh, administering, um, uh, based on the on the history of the patient, on the data uh, I have shown you, um, I, I, uh, I have this opportunity to present this case to you. So uh, for me, it would be uh, very helpful uh, to know your opinion about uh, what we have to do next. Uh, some uh, suggest suggestions have been uh, have been done, but if there are any suggestions of any other syndromes or disease we might have uh, uh, missed, uh, we can we can search for. Or even if uh, you think that we should uh, uh, perform a, a, a whole clinical exome or a whole genome exome uh, to find the right diagnosis for this patient. Uh, and the, the second and last question I would like to ask you is uh, considering the therapy we are administering uh, and considering that we don't have a, a, a diagnosis, but we have a, a very um, wide phenotype, uh, uh, would you suggest any other therapy, any other immunosuppressive therapy? So perhaps the audience can, if the audience would like to chime in, I know we only have a few minutes left on, on any therapeutic suggestions. We have one from Jude who asked about sirolimus. Was that ever considered? Uh, yeah, I, I think uh, sirolimus is, is uh, on the table, is now uh, under consideration uh, because mm, we know that mm, we are not controlling is. Uh, uh, symptoms with just uh, steroids. So even though we have no uh, clear indication of a possible diagnosis, we uh, may ha have to change the therapy that has for so long been administered. So uh, in my opinion, uh, Sirolimus is a, a good choice to, uh, to consider. Okay. Is there any other thoughts from the audience about uh, the current therapy listed there or any other uh, therapies that might be suggested here. This is a challenging case, there's no question. <laughs> uh, 
we have one comment about uh, valproate toxicity. Is that considered? Uh, sorry? Uh, we have one, one final comment about um, valproate toxicity. Oh, um, in terms of a fetal defect, was that ever considered? Yeah, yeah. Uh, yes, we. Uh, well, actually, we haven't uh, considered considered as a, a a possible case, a, a possible a possibility. Uh, but um, maybe we can think about it. Uh, even though I, I think it's uh, quite unlikely because uh, symptoms were uh, present uh, even before he, he started this therapy. But of course, we we can ask for, we, we can consider a, a, another drug. Well, I think the suggestion was maybe Valpro neonatal toxicity that might explain the stomatitis and the you know, the um, cardiac and thymic abnormalities, I'm not. Oh, well, no, I, I, mm, uh, in, in, that, uh, in that case, I uh, can exclude it because he, he wasn't on this therapy at the time. Okay, okay. Well, I think our, our time is uh, growing short here, um, and I know, I know we don't want to go too, too much farther over, and we want to let you and uh, David get some sleep <laughs> here soon. Hmm. Um, so I think I think we'll stop there and I'll just thank uh, both uh, Dr. Hagen and, and Dr. Satini for uh, being so kind to present these cases from um, Israel and Italy respectively. And I'll also thank Dr. Mike Jordan at Cincinnati Children's Hospital for uh, serving as our senior mentor. Um, so uh, again, thank you very much to USIDNet and Masset for their generous support of the webinar series. We will be taking a summer break, so this is the last uh, webinar until the fall. But uh, as we always remind you, we're looking for great cases um, to start up again later this year. So if you have them, please consider contacting us and presenting in a future webinar. So with that, I'll, I'll just uh, thank my co-moderator, Chu Tashar, and um, say sign off for the night. So thank you very much for joining us. Thank you very much for this great opportunity. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone. Have a great summer. Bye.